Thank you. Welcome to the meeting. I declare the meeting open at three minutes past six o'clock. On behalf of the City of Vincent, I pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land, the Wadjuk Noongar people, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to let the members of the gallery know that we are um, web streaming this meeting. It's a new initiative of the City of Vincent, so this is the second council meeting that we'll be streaming. But we do take your privacy into consideration and we won't be screening public question time, so when you um, speak at the microphone, you won't be transmitted to the people out there listening. So just to let you know that. Um, and we will begin the live stream after we've finished public question time. CEO, do we have any apologies or members on approved leave of absence? Um, Mayor Cole, we have a uh, leave of absence already approved uh, for Councillor Jimmy Murphy which runs from the 10th of June to the 28th of June inclusive. Um, I've also received an apology from Councillor Harley, but she has requested that's for this evening. Councillor Harley, um, later under agenda item four, will be requesting leave of absence until next week. Thank you, CEO. Um, now it's time for public question time. So if you'd like to come up and address council, please feel free to do so. We have finished public question time. We are now going into live streaming. So if there is anyone um, joining us from home this evening, we welcome you to the meeting. We've just finished public question time and we're now moving on to agenda item um, four, which is applications for leaves, leave of absence. Um, I believe we have a few CEO. Um, yes, Mayor Cole, we do. We have uh, a few council members, the first being from Mayor Emma Cole requesting leave of absence from the 7th of July to the 17th of July this year inclusive due to personal commitments. Did you want me to read all of them first? And then write on them the Can I have a mover for me to take some leave, please? I moved Councillor Toppelberg, second Councillor Hallett. All those in favour? Thank you. That declare it carried. Uh, the second leave of absence request we've received is from Councillor Tobelberg seeking leave of absence from the 4th of July to the 11th of Ju July inclusive due to work commitments. Can I have a mover please? Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Gondoshevsky. All those in favour? Thank you. Declare it carried. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Also received a request from uh, Councillor Buckles from the 3rd of July to the 15th of July inclusive. Can I please have a move? Before, actually, before I move this, I just want to state that we don't have a council meeting or briefing scheduled, so if you're worried about us not having a quorum, there will be no council briefing or meeting during this phase, so we, we will be okay. <laughs> Can I please have a mover? Moved Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Hallett. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Uh, and lastly, Mayor Cole from Councillor Harvey, uh, sorry, Councillor Ros Harley received a request this evening seeking leave of absence from the 27th of June being this evening to the 4th of July inclusive due to personal reasons. Can I please have a mover? Moved Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Buckles. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Okay, moving on to receiving of petitions, deputations and presentations. I believe there are nil. And then confirmation of minutes for the ordinary meeting of the 30th of May 2017. Do I have a mover for the confirmation of the minutes? Councillor Loden moved. Seconded Councillor Gondoshevsky. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Okay, moving on to announcements by the presiding member. 
Um, I have three announcements tonight, just to mention that we have launched Imagine Vincent, which is our community engagement exercise, which will run for three months um, to inform our strategic community plan. Um, we launched and had a workshop on Thursday the 8th of June at the North Perth Town Hall, where we had a large cross-section of the community represented. There was a great feeling of energy um, and dialogue in the room and the purpose of that gathering was to actually form the main questions that will, um, will inform our consultation exercise. So seven questions under seven themes were formed um, on the day by the residents and ratepayers who came along to that session and uh, that's now going to be carried forth over the next three months of consultation. So there'll be a range of um, activities happening across the next um, couple of months which um, involves things like hosting conversations, lots of activity on our online website and um, if anyone is interested in checking it out, it's www.imagine.vincent.wa.gov.au. Also, just to mention, as raised by Councillor Buckles at the last meeting, we are about to um, be in July, and it is plastic-free July. So, as part of um, as, <laughs> as part of marking plastic-free July, we will be having a free presentation by Perth writer Lindsay Miles, who will be talking about tips to eradicate plastics from your domestic life. So if anyone is interested, that will be on Thursday the 6th of July from 6 to 7 p.m. here at the Administration Building. And also just to follow up to let um, people know that I have written to the Minister for the Environment seeking a statewide ban on plastic bags and also to the Minister for Local Government seeking his support in lobbying his ministerial colleagues on a statewide plastic ban as well as um, supporting local government in any moves to introduce their own local laws. And finally, just to mention that Revelation Film Festival will be on from the 6th to the 19th of July and we'll be celebrating 20 years of um, the festival and the city is very happy to be a sponsor of this great um, community arts event again, uh, with Leaderville becoming one of the main hubs for the festival. And City of Vincent is sponsoring two fantastic um, free events for children this year. The first is Revelation Celebration, which is some free films during the school holidays showing for children. Had a little look online, they look absolutely fantastic. And Rev Shorts, which will be at our own Vincent Library, where you can go along and see some. Um, short films at our pop-up cinema. Oh, of course. And um, something that I should have mentioned first off is that I'd also just like to acknowledge that Rick Lotznicker, um, our Director of Technical Services, has recently left the City of Vincent after 17 years of long service at the City of Vincent, um, one of our long-standing members of staff and at the time that he left I thanked him for his significant contribution to the City. I think that the high quality of, um, of works that we see in technical services in our parks and gardens, um, some of the recent improvements like our bike paths, our street planting, the change made at the Car Street and Newcastle Street intersection are just um, some very recent examples of the fine work that has happened in technical services. So um, I did personally thank Rick um, for all that he's given to the city, but I'd also just like to acknowledge that at this meeting tonight and thank him sincerely on behalf of all of us from the City of Vincent. He has left to pursue other opportunities and we do wish him well. Now I'll move on to declarations of interest. Through you, Mayor Cole, we've received uh, two. The first is from Mayor Emma Cole in relation to item 9.2. Um, the property at 193 to 195 Scarborough Beach Road, Mount Hawthorne. Mayor Coles disclosed an impartiality interest in this item, the basis, or the basis of the interest being that uh, Mayor Coles' sister and friends live on the boulevard. However, they are not neighbours of the development, have not contacted the Mayor to discuss the application, and the Mayor is not aware of whether they have provided any comment during consultation on this particular matter. Nevertheless, as a consequence, the Mayor's disclosed there may be a perception that her impartiality on the matter could be affected. The Mayor's disclosed that she will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. 
The second disclosure of interest, um, councillors, through the Mayor that we've received is from myself personally. It's a disclosure of financial interest in item 18.1 relating to my uh, annual performance review. The obvious extent of my interest being that it relates to my performance in the role of CEO, my remuneration and my contract of employment with the city. Thank you, CEO. We'll now move on to debating the reports on the agenda tonight. But before we do so, I'll just go around the table to see if council members would like to pull out any items that haven't already been raised in the public gallery for debate this evening. Councillor Hallett, are there any items that you wish to pull out from the agenda for debate? 14.1 uh, and 10.2. Thank you, Councillor Buckles. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Uh, just 12.1 and 12.3. Councillor Loden. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 10.1, uh, please. Okay, so Okay, I'll just ask the CEO to run through the items that will be moved on block, which um, for anyone who's not experienced in council meetings, that means that they are the items that won't be debated and that once we vote on them, they have been adopted by council as recommended by officers. Um, CEO, could you please take us through those items? Sure. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, as the Mayor's indicated, uh, members of the public and also uh, anyone streaming in at home, Council standing orders require or enable Council to adopt items on block. There are a number of items that are excluded from being able to be adopted on block and they are items that have been the subject of a uh, question or comment during public question time, items that Council members have now just uh, requested be withdrawn for separate discussion, any absolute majority items and any confidential items. What that has left as a consequence of uh, ruling out all of those items is that the following items are now the only items that Council will be considering adoption of in an on-block fashion, meaning all at once. They are item 11.1, item 11.2, 11.3, 12.2 and 13.1. Uh, all other items will be discussed individually. Can I please have a mover for the on block items? Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Hallett. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Okay, we will be dealing with the development service items first, but we do take them in the order in which they've been raised by the public gallery. So there will be a bit of jumping around. We won't be following through in sequence. So the first item that we'll be debating tonight is item 9.1, which is the further report on 94 Burke Street, Leadable. Do I have a mover for this item? Councillor Buckles and a seconder. Councillor Loden. Thank you, Chair. Let me just... Oh, excuse me, bring that up here. Look, um, I actually think that um, the, ch the changes that have been made here are appropriate for this, lo this location and it, um, you know, it's not, it's not going to be um, the greatest development anyone's ever seen, but it certainly won't be the worst, including just on Burke Street at the moment. Um, so 
I live on Burke Street, but not close enough to make a conflict of interest, but I'm pretty comfortable having this as a relatively close neighbour and happy to support it. Um, just a quick question. Um, I got an uh, email through from, uh, from the person on behalf of a resident at 4 slash 263 Oxford Street, um, which I passed on to the Director of Development Services in regards to a wall that fell down and uh, shattered a window and caused some other damage into their property. Um, the Director provided a response about uh, half, half an hour before the meeting, just in regards, regards to request for a dilapidation report. just wanted to um, confirm that that is effectively already a requirement within the approval that's been granted. Uh, through the Mayor, um, yes, the, the City's policy requires a dilapidation report where there's the potential for um, a development to impact on an adjoining property. Um, so. In this case, we have looked at the adjoining properties and there are two properties in particular that are extremely close to the boundary. And so dilapidation reports will be required um, as part of the construction management plan. Thank you. Um, I guess uh, similar to um, Councillor Buckle's comments, I'm, uh, it's not the greatest development, but it is broadly consistent with what we're seeing in that uh, streetscape. There is a slight um, increase in the setback, but that is a effectively a transition from um, the properties to the east and then to a, a, a property that's basically right on the boundary, so that seems appropriate to me. So I'm happy to support the officer recommendation. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Yeah, look, just in relation to the setback, which is, I guess, what we're being asked to consider in terms of discretion. Um, uh, if the zero setback of the corner lot is included in the calculation, um, this would for a deemed to comply provision, um, this would actually reduce the required setback to uh, 5.8 metres um, rather than 7 metres. So I guess discretion is still, you know, is, is required in this instance, but if you actually do calculate um, the impact of the commercial lot on the corner, um, I do support and understand the argument of transition. I also note that this design has changed since originally coming before council, so we've got access coming from the common driveway and that we've got conditions in place to ensure that the design advice of the design advisory committee is incorporated um, and that also note that um, the design meets our landscaping provisions, which also um, helps to soften the impact of um, the, this new build. So yeah, I support the officer recommendation um, in, for the reduced setback in this instance. Any further comments on this one? Councillor Toppelberg? Just very quickly, um, more so in relation to process than anything else, just uh, I appreciate that the applicants um, have engaged with the city uh, through the early process, but certainly I would imagine the time, money and effort that's been spent since this was first deferred, uh, had that money been time and effort and energy being spent up front uh, together with the city. And I think there's probably lessons on both sides. As I said, we've been lucky to have a, a willing applicant to work through uh, with us. And uh, uh, whilst it was pointed out that some of the conditions here go above and beyond what is required under the R codes, uh, given that discretion is being applied uh, or, or is being sought um, and that these are requirements in order to meet the design principles, they are valid conditions in my view. But I do appreciate the efforts uh, from the applicant. Um, but again, I, I think it, it's a good example where that money, effort and time being spent at the beginning would probably have delivered uh, an outcome that was uh, quicker and easier and potentially cheaper for everybody um, and uh, would have delivered, I think, an even better result on the street. But um, other than the setback, it's, it's compliant and there's, uh, there's very little uh, grounds for any other decision. Thank you, Councillor Toppelberg. I would just like to add to that to say thank you to the applicant for working with the City and with the Design Advisory Committee over the last month since uh, the deferral um, last at the last council meeting. I do think that it, there is a significant improvement and in terms of the reduced setback, I think now that there's been the removal of the second crossover that's allowed for um, better interface with, with the street and better landscaping. So I'm happy to support this and I do thank you for making those changes. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put the item. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Okay, I'm moving on to item 9.6, which is number 169, Oxford Street Leaderville, change of use from shop to cinema and associated alterations and additions to the existing building, the Lunar Cinema. 
Does, uh, do we have a mover? Councillor Gondoszewski, seconded Councillor Tobelberg. Uh, yes, thank you. Just through you, Mayor, to the Director of Development Services, I just wanted to um, get some clarity around the bike parking. Um, we had a, the speaker tonight um, was requesting the removal of the condition in relation to the relocation of bike parking facilities. So if, if we could just get some additional information on that, it would be great. Um, through the Mayor, the, the condition, condition 9.2, um, relates only to the visitor parking. Um, the bike bays are currently shown on the northern side of the building, um, tucked away behind or in that service corridor. Um, it wasn't considered that they were um, easily accessible for visitors or um, that visitors would know they were, were there at all. Um, and as a result, a condition was recommended requiring them to be located so they're easily accessible from the entry um, and close to the entry. Um, so they were convenient for uh, for visitors. Staff parking in that location is considered reasonable. Staff will know that the parking bays are there, but um, it's just the visitors where the concern was. There's flexibility in how the bays are located and where they're located within the development. There's no requirement for, the, for them to be necessarily in the foyer as long as they're easily accessible um, and visible. We haven't um, had a detailed conversation with the applicant, however, regarding um, the exact location of these bays. Um, and that's why the conditions worded the way it is, so that we can have a, a more detailed conversation with them about how they can accommodate those visitor parking bays for bicycles. Okay, thank you. Um, also, just uh, can we get some clarity um, for the Oxford Street resident in relation to the um, noise attenuation and containing noise within the building? Uh, through the Mayor, um, the City has um, an acoustic or a noise management plan based policy which makes it very clear what the requirements are for all developments uh, in relation to noise. Um, a condition has been included or recommended um, for Council to approve the development, uh, to approve that, rec that condition, sorry, requiring an acoustic report um, be provided to the City prior to um, development commencing on site which would demonstrate that they can comply and that they will comply um, with the, the State Government's noise regulations, which are very strict after hours. Um, and following that, um, the, once the construction commences and is completed, before they can commence using the cinema, um, they are also required by that condition to demonstrate to the City that they have implemented all of the requirements of that acoustic report and that the noise levels don't exceed the regulations. So before they can actually use the cinema, they have to demonstrate that the, the standards have been met um, and that the adjoining residents won't be impacted by noise. So that's the, the recommendation, that's the process that we follow here at the City. Okay, thank you. Um, look, I'm happy to support this, the officer recommendation. I guess uh, I think several years ago it seemed as though cinemas were on the way out with streaming and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I absolutely agree that a cinema in a local area can add to the vibrancy and pull patrons to the area. Um, and so, yeah, happy to support this. Councillor Toppelberg. Does anyone have any further comment? Councillor Buckles. Uh, yeah, look, I'm, I'm really happy to see this development go ahead. The other day I was driving past um, the Luna on the way to drop the kids off at school and I noted some people with clipboards pointing up at the building and I was dreadfully concerned that they were discussing reconverting the Luna Cinema into something else. So it's great to see I was unaware at that stage of the, the DA in, so it's good to see um, this happening. It just, just having a look at the plans and these, these bicycle racks, I mean, it does look to me like there's no gate in between the street and the bicycle parking, which is quite nicely tucked away, um, and it could easily be made more visible through some signage at the front of the building. I'm sure a website or whatever could indicate where the bicycle parking is, and I can see, looking at the map as well, that, you know, putting it in the outdoor lounge would, be, would actually be quite, quite difficult, I think, and then the, the pathway in between would also be awkward in terms of accessibility. So I'm quite comfortable with the bike parking as it is, and um, it's a shame we don't have the cattle, cattle rack, as it was called. We could have put that up in the parking bay outside the front here, even though I used to loathe that thing with a passion. But <laughs> have we still got it somewhere? It's still available. We've still got it. So, you know, that could go in the parking bay out the front as sort of a little lunar parklet or something a bit more 
uh, advance there. So look, there's a um, the condition 1.2, which was raised by the uh, by the applicants as being being problematic. I actually don't have a problem removing that, and I'm just going to have a look for it. Sorry, because I wasn't really aware of that being a being an issue until now. Um, I mean, I guess I just feel that the visitor bays are vaguely convenient to the entrance. They're not, they're not massively inconvenient to the entrance, and I think they're reasonable. I think they're, they're reasonably located, and could, people could be made that, aware that they are, that they are there. Um, so I would like to move removing 1.2, because I think the, the bays as shown are okay. So if I could move that amendment, if that's okay with you, Madam Chair. Do I have a seconder, Councillor Tobelberg? Councillor Buckles, do you wish to comment further? Councillor Tobelberg? I, I mean, I had considered it when it was raised. I guess the condition calling for them to be relocated would suggest that they would be moved, but I, would, I had, after hearing the director's comments, I thought they'd probably end up back where they were anyway because it is somewhat convenient to the entrance. Um, but I, I have no issue with it being removed. I think that it's reasonable. I also think that um, the onus then falls uh, to some degree upon the lunar to ensure that the bikes themselves are secure because they'll be in some ways removed from um, public view down the side so that there are some issues there in relation to bike security but that falls fairly and squarely on them given that it's their property I would assume so um, yeah I, I have no issue with the removal of the condition. Any further comments on the amendment? Okay I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Back to the substantive. Are there any further comments on the substantive motion? Um, look, I will comment. I think it's fantastic to see the Lunar Cinema expand and as, um, as we've heard, bucking the trend. Um, it is a fantastic independent cinema and as mentioned, the Rev Festival. Um, Lunar is one of the heartland places for the Revelation Film Festival and um, very popular in the local um, community as independent film um, place to go. Um, in relation to the cash in lieu that was raised, and I do want to deal with that issue, uh, I think the difficulty in um, potentially seeking a waiver of the cash in lieu for this particular development is that um, while I can see why you've removed the eight car bays to make the cinema work and to have the outdoor area, it is very difficult for the council to justify um, waiving cash in lieu in the context of bays being removed as well as the fact that Leaderville is really under parking pressure. It's an issue that we hear a lot about from local businesses in Leaderville and uh, it is regularly very difficult to get a car park and at the volume of people that potentially could be coming through the cinemas um, to, to not um, provide cash in lieu is a, is a difficult um, ask of, the, of this council in circumstances. So um, just wanted to address that issue, but in terms of the actual development, Really pleased to see this happen and um, wish you all the best with the expansion. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put the item. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Moving on now to item 9.2, which is number 193 to 195 Scarborough Beach Road, Mount Hawthorne change of use from plant nursery and incidental shop and eating house to eating house and incidental shop and plant nursery. Do I have a mover for this item? Moved Councillor Loden. Seconded Councillor Gontoshevsky. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, firstly, just a, a question on this one. Uh, we had a question from the floor around the justification of cash in lieu given that the uh, facility had operated for has been operating for five years um, without having an impact on parking. If you could just provide a response for for that, please. Um, through the mayor, there's really two issues. One is um, the existing demand for parking in the area is high. Um, the bays are often f full, particularly during the day, um, and the city has received complaints regarding. Um, parking in the area, um, though there hasn't been, you know, from our analysis of the city's records over the last three years, there hasn't been um, a huge number of complaints. There has been some complaints, though. Um, we don't have a, a final number because um, we haven't been able to assess all of the records, but there have been some complaints that we've, we've found. Um, the city is proposing to um, undertake um, 
as part of the budget proposal uh, process at the moment, is considering um, including an item on the budget next year to um, increase the amount of parking in the area to try and get another 21 bays in there. Um, that's partly because um, the park, um, Braithwaite Park, um, is highly utilised um, and there is increasing demand for the use of that park. Um, however, there's clearly um, a high demand at the moment already and that's part of the reason why additional parking is needed. So, um, in essence, the, the development is proposing 150 persons, um, which has been the, the case, it sounds, for a number of years. Um, the number of bays um, on the site doesn't address that issue. There's a, um, a significant shortfall uh, and as a result the city's policy makes it clear that um, cash and loo should be recommended. So. Thank you, Director. Um, also, um, the Mayor put together an amendment for this item and I'm happy to move that amendment at this time as well. That's the, the orange one. I'll just check with the seconder whether you're happy to second the amendment at the same time or would you prefer to deal with the substantive first? I'm happy to second the amendment so it can be discussed. Okay, well we have a seconder for the amendment, so please go ahead, Councillor Loden. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so effectively this amendment's proposing to reduce the, um, the number of, uh, the, the amount of cash in lieu through a reduction in the number of car bays from 11.44 to 7.792. Um, to shift the cost and then base, on base cost of $4,048 per bay, um, effectively to align the cost of uh, cash in lieu with the cost that we would incur to create the additional bays that, we've, that was just mentioned by the Director of uh, Technical Services, uh, Development Services, um, and also to amend the uh, maximum number of persons from 150 to 120 people as well. Do you wish to comment further or um, should I move to the seconder? Okay, Councillor Gondoshevsky. I just have a question in relation to the reduction of uh, person numbers, whether this has been discussed with the applicant. It appears that the business has been operating at a 150 capacity for five years. Um, and so I guess uh, I presume that the reduction in cost in cash in lieu associated with this option would have to be offset with a reduction in the income from 30 pat patrons. Uh, and I just wanted to know whether the applicant has uh, had time to comment on this. Thank you, Councillor. Look, I'll just say that I did um, request the, de the Director of Development Services to raise this um, with discussion um, with the applicant, and it is my understanding that that was agreed to, but I will just pass to the Director to confirm. Yes, through the Mayor. Um, it was discussed, the, the numbers, um, and 120 was, um, I think, the absolute minimum, acceptable minimum. Um, just noting that it is the maximum, 150 was the maximum proposed, um, so it's not the average number that's occurring on the site, um, and 120 was considered to be acceptable by the applicant as an absolute minimum. Uh, just one further question in relation to compliance over patron numbers. I note from, I believe from the acoustic report that there was 130 persons. That was a number that was given previously around, um, I think, you know, Sunday patronage or something at breakfast and so on. Um, I'm just, just querying uh, what sort of action the city takes in this regard. Um, sorry, if you could clarify. Um, my question just relates to if we have a reduction in um, person numbers that's supported under this application, um, what, how will the city um, be able to determine if that has actually occurred? Uh, through the Mayor, the city, in, in these circumstances, the city is very proactive in its compliance um, where a site has a very strict um, limit. The city will undertake inspections um, and from there, once it's been established that um, the level or that the numbers are being complied with, um, the city will then uh, you know, uh, revert back to its ordinary practice, which is to deal with issues as, um, as complaints um, come in. 
Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, I'll just make a couple of comments and then I'll ask a question. But just, I know the applicant did ask last week at the briefing um, whether anyone else in the street had uh, paid cash in lieu. And my understanding is that up until 2013, with one exception, any application in the city of Vincent for change of use or for new build had paid cash in lieu or had been charged cash in lieu or had a cash in lieu condition applied to them full stop throughout the city. So uh, the answer is any business on there that exists that actually went through an application process, if they exist there with an approval, they've done so having paid cash in lieu. So it's not by exception. This here, in my understanding, is we're trying to create a bespoke solution for somebody which uh, I have issue with what that, how that then relates back to the policy. But I just want to I note so the car parking policy under 2.4.1, the three conditions under which, and I understand it's at our discretion and we may waive, but the officers responded to my request last week saying that uh, part B of that clause wasn't met. So the clause reads, where the application does not involve any building works that contribute to additional floor area that would be subject to parking requirements. And the, what's explained is that because of the change of use in the square metre, because they're building toilets, that that's therefore building. That's not the intent of the clause nor the wording of the clause. It specifically says the building works contribute to additional floor area that would be subject to parking requirements, which my understanding is that that's, that's not the case. So can I just get some clarity from the director? My understanding is whether council chooses to waive or otherwise, and I'll get, the reason I ask is that my preference would be that if this amendment were to be successful, it would relate directly to that clause and the ability within the policy to vary it because it's met those conditions rather than a bespoke, this is what it's costing next door, because that, I think, leaves us with gaping holes for f potentially for future applications. So just, again, if we can clarify, where the clause says uh, does not involve any building works that contribute to additional floor area that would be subject to parking requirements. Does the building of the toilets actually mean that it's additional floor area subject to parking requirements? Um, the simple answer to that question is no. The building, the, the toilets themselves do not contribute to the parking requirements. The floor area, it's actually patron numbers that contribute to the parking requirements. So those, the, the building of that toilet facilitates the patron numbers, which is what contributes to the, the parking requirements. So perhaps when, this, when the policy was prepared, it was based on the floor area of the entire development or the floor area of, of just the restaurant. But nevertheless, it's very clear um, to me that the, the toilet, without the toilets, the patron numbers could not increase, and therefore those building works contribute to the additional parking requirements. Can I just jump in here because I think that one of the critical issues missing in the answer is that we're comparing current practice to approval whereas we're comparing what the current use is which is a plant nursery. So we're looking at this being a retrospective use and the fact that the parking requirements were in place for a plant nursery with ancillary eating house and shop whereas the current practice of majority eating house may have been in place for five years but has not had the approval or the car parking requirement dealt with because it hasn't actually had an approval. Okay. So just so I understand the, the director's answer, but I still the when this clause was introduced I opposed it at the time, but I do think it was quite clear. It basically said for changes of use and it was particularly focused around town centres. If you remember we removed we excluded um, uh, small bars and taverns from it, so basically for people chasing the alcohol dollar was, uh, was the discussion at the time, but effectively this said as long as you're not taking parking bays away or building more building, that a change of use was just a change of use because the floor space was existent anyway. And it, that was essentially, that was the, the debate. At the, so my reading is that it actually meets the provisions of that policy, but again, that's in part a technicality, but I think it's important that if we are now going to have you know, we're looking at our fees and charges in a few weeks. Are we going to be changing the fees and charges because here we've got bays that are being built at this much? I think that uh, the director has also spoken about the impact of our works at Braithwaite Park and the increase of the popularity uh, there of the park. So for me, it, uh, I'm, there's a couple of arguments that have been made by the applicant. Uh, it's asking, you know, the, the question was asked about the impact of car parking in the area. We have a report later in the agenda which talks about exactly about that, and that is why we're, we're seeking to change the parking. Uh, the, um, the parking restrictions in the area. We know that there's money on budget to actually increase the number of bays within the area. Um, so I think that uh, 
the fact that it's been operating for five years without approval is actually probably working to their detriment rather than their advantage in that in that way. But yeah, I, I have an issue with reducing the cost because of the cost of the bays next door. I'd be more comfortable in doing so on the basis that it meets the intent of the policy uh, as it reads. So technicality, I know, but that's that's where I sit. Well, can I just follow up on that? Because I think then if we're, if we're looking at that particular point, this is a question. What, um, so if we're looking at going back five years to when this was a nursery with an ancillary shop and ancillary eating house, and we had a fresh application for a 150 person eating house with a different use of the floor space, would that provision of the policy be met? Because that's effectively the way we have to make the assessment. Well, my understanding is that this provision didn't exist then, but nevertheless, if we were in a situation now where it hadn't been operating, um, my recommendation would be the same in that the addition of... It's a technicality, but from that, the reading of that provision, my understanding is the intent is that additional building works that result in additional parking requirements um, trigger the need for cash and loo to be paid. So in this case the additional building works, though they're a technicality, the development cannot have the additional patron numbers without those toilets. And so the toilets are additional works that are required in order to accommodate um, the additional patrons and parking numbers. It is a complex matter, given the retrospective nature. Is there, um, Councillor Tolberg, do you wish to continue? No? Are there any further comments or questions? Councillor Buckles? I'd just like to... Um, thank you, Madam Chair. The, I note that we the ori originally had um, a capacity of 150 with a cash in lieu of 61,000, and now we've had a rethink about how we might charge for the cash in lieu and then set it at 120. But given... I guess given that we... Um, did originally have a recommendation to go to 150 subject to cash in lieu being paid. Is there, and I'll ask this as a question to the director, is it possible for us to approve this, that if under this method of calculating, if the applicant was to say, you know what, I want to go to 150 base, which we were going to accept anyway, subject to paying additional cash in lieu, I don't want them to have to come back to council for an extra 30 seats. And so is there any way we can build it in so that they can choose to go to 150 and pay an increased cash in lieu with, with, and that just being an administrative matter, matter to clean up than have to come to us for another change of use. So it's not really changing anything other than the formula that we've got here, but just giving them that flexibility. Uh, through the Mayor, the, the, current way, the current wording of that condition, if the applicant wanted to come back and increase the number to 150 or any other number, they would need to seek an amendment to this approval which would, would come before Council. Um, whether it can be built into the condition, um, it probably could be, but that will take some time to put that wording together and we don't have that wording before us. Um, as I said, the applicant was willing to accept 120 with that cash in lieu payment um, and I'm sure that if uh, the, they would like to increase the num maximum number of patrons that they would make an application and go through that process once they were comfortable to pay the additional cash in lieu. It just seems really awkward to me that we would essentially be happy to approve it at an increased amount and have for having, having it come through this, um, this process, which is going to cost us administrative time in setting an agenda item and putting, putting it through. Um, look, I don't, I don't know. I must admit I don't have the words off, the, off the, my cuff either to how we, how we would word that. Um, So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it as it is, but um, I mean, whether or not we could possibly defer it for later in the evening and come back to it when we've figured out some wording, if, if that would be an option to do, I just think, you know, I mean, obviously I'm happy to, I'm happy to support what's on the, on the table as an amendment, and I'd be happy to support 150 at 11.44 times 4,048. So I don't... I, um, but obviously, if they want to go at 120, I don't want to force them to pay extra cash in lieu if they're happy to stay at 120. You know, but it just seems strange for the sake of full car bays to have them go through a new planning application if they wanted to increase. Um, I'll see if I can come up with some words in two seconds. 
Or perhaps I could fill up some time by talking to the item while <laughs> you have a think about it. Look, I do, I do want to say to the applicant that um, that that um, Castle Bianchi is a very valuable institution in Mount Hawthorne. Um, we have had all sorts of difficulties with um, disused petrol stations in our neighbourhood and that this is the best adaptive reuse of a petrol station that I've ever seen in City of Vincent, possibly Perth and even further afield. So um, we do really value your business and we, we want you to remain pros prosperous. Um, the issue that is very difficult to justify around the cash in lieu is that council, independently of this application, has identified that there is a parking need in the vicinity, um, that we are currently under our draft budget considering spending $85,000 on 21 parking bays in the immediate facility, 13 of which would immediately abut the cafe on the verge. Um, so it's very, in those circumstances, it's very difficult for the city to waive cash in lieu because we'd be effectively asking ratepayers to fully fund those car bays without a contribution from a cafe or sorry eating house where there is a shortfall and the issue I think that complicates this is because of the fact that it is a retrospective application and that you have been operating for five years and that the parking requirement is based on your current operation which you currently don't have approval for because you're still operating as a plant nursery. So that's the that's the complication. But from the council's perspective, independent of this application, we've recognised that there is a need for parking in that area, and we're funding it to the value of eighty-five thousand dollars. So that is that is based on the current usage. It's not based upon seeking a nighttime usage because I believe in the evening the car parking need is not there. The car parking need is actually current and it's, it's daytime and it's about around the current hours of operation. So effectively because you are seeking a retrospective approval to do what you've already been doing for five years, I can understand why you see it from your perspective but at the same time the city does need to deal with the fact that even the current operation without any extension of hours has led to a car parking shortfall which we are about to request ratepayers fund so in those circumstances, it is very difficult to justify waiving cash in lieu completely. But there is a unique situation here in that we do have cash in lieu set per bay under our fees and charges, but this particular situation, we actually have a budget estimate on what those car parking bays immediate to your vicinity are going to cost. So that is a very unusual situation and why I believe that we can make a departure from the normal cash in lieu requirement. And... Um, in discussion with yourselves, I understand that 120 pa patrons is, is, is reasonable, um, given that it does impact on the cash in lieu, which is of major concern to you and the, the functioning of your business. So we've been able to effectively reduce the cash in lieu with a combination of reduction in, in numbers of patrons and in actually charging the actual cost to the city of providing that shortfall to you, um, which is a reduction of some $30,000 in car parking cash in lieu. So I think that it is a good outcome and, it's, and I personally don't feel that I'm able to waive cash in lieu for, for your business but then um, fund it directly and exclusively by the city. So that's where... I stand on this issue and it's not to say that we don't recognise that your business is a fantastic adaptive reuse and that we really want you to stay and succeed, but it's, it's, a, it's really about trying to achieve a balance and making sure that, that it's fair and equitable for the public purse as well as for your business. So that's why I've put up this amendment. Um, is there any further comment or Councillor Buckles, do you wish to ask a question about your idea of postponing the item until further in the evening. It does seem that from what the director is saying is that it's not a com it is quite a complex amendment. Um, can, director, do you wish to comment any further on that request? Um, through you, Mayor. No, I've, I've just had a go and it is very complicated. Um, yeah, it's very, very complicated, so... So I take it from that that you're not going to be able to produce that amendment through the course of the evening and that we will either need to defer or we'll need to continue on with this motion. Yeah. Um, 
through you, Mayor Cole, just a question, if I may, to Councillor Buckles. If I understand the suggestion accurately, it is that, um, Councillor Buckles, are you proposing that the conditions be somehow modified to allow the applicant to trade up to a maximum of 150 persons if the maximum uh, cash in lieu shortfall is paid, which is 11.44? Is that the gist of it? That, that would be right. Look, the, the best I came up with was notes as a 6.2, you could note that should the applicant wish to increase capacity to 150 persons, this would be considered an administrative matter, however would incur appropriate cash, the cash in lieu at $4,048 per bay. But then I got caught up with, well, what happens if they did it in two years and our cash in lieu has gone up by CPI and then you've got to work that in. And and then the delegate authority to you, but I don't know whether it's appropriate to delegate authority within a within a planning a planning approval. It'd be easy just to do it at 150 at 4,000, but I don't think the applicant wants to go at 150 at 4,000. So no, that's right. So I would I won't do that. Yeah. You can see the complexity of planning. <laughs> okay, I think that we've decided that we'll go ahead um, as amended. Um, actually, sorry, I, have, I haven't taken a vote. Oh yes, we have. No, we haven't. Um, I have to take a vote on the amendment. All those in favour of the amendment? I declare it carried. Did I already do that? No, you didn't. I didn't. Josh, didn't vote. Josh uh, uh, Councillor Tobelberg, are you voting? Oh, sorry, that's my fault. Sorry. It's only early in the evening. I do apologise. I'll try that again. All those in favour of the amendment on the orange? All those against? Thank you, Councillor Tobelberg. Um, are there any further comments on the substantive? Councillor Gondoshevsky. I just had some queries in relation to bike parking. It wasn't actually really covered in the body of the report, and it appears there's a shortfall based on the current patron numbers or area. So perhaps the Director of Development Services could clarify. Uh, yes, through the Mayor, um, apologies for that, that not being clarified in the report. Um, there is substantial bike parking located within the immediate vicinity of the development. There are, um, there's a U-rail um, directly out the front of the um, entry from Scarborough Beach Road. Uh, there are U-rails located on the corner, multiple U-rails located on the including a heart, I think, located on the corner of um, the Boulevard and Scarborough Beach Road. Um, there's also opportunities for bike parking in Braithwaite Park and significant opportunity around uh, the fencing along the boulevard in Braithwaite Park. Um, so there's also opportunity for staff to park their bicycles within the development. There's a, um, a secure service area at the rear. So um, as a result, uh, it's not recommended that bicycle, bicycle parking um, be required as a condition of this approval given there's um, considered to be adequate bicycle parking located immediately around and within the development site. Thank you. Uh, just a question through you to the director. Given the wording of condition, new condition six, um, do you think it would be worthwhile or superfluous to include an advice note to say that it was already budgeted and therefore, just, I'm just thinking about preventing future circumstances where people come to potentially ask for the cost of providing the bays for, uh, for, for cash in lieu payments, because obviously it's a reduction significantly from what uh, is proposed in the fees and charges. Would an advice note be helpful uh, for future circumstances, or is that easily explainable given the wording of the condition? Um, through the Mayor, given the wording of um, the, the administration comment on the amendment um, and the reason for the amendment, I think it's quite clear as to the reason the number per bay or the cash and lieu payment per bay was reduced. I think that's quite clear. Um, an advice note um, wouldn't necessarily address that for the, for the general public. Um, Any further comments on this item? Okay, I'd just also like to point out that with cash in lieu, the city does offer a payment plan of up to five years, so that can be paid over five years just to lessen the financial burden. All right, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Thank you. Moving on to item 9.5, submission to Welga third party appeal rights in planning. Do I have a mover for this item? 
Councillor Buckles, seconder. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Look, um, I'm more than happy to support this item. Um, I think purely, mostly, I think it is interesting to see what Walga comes up with and then state government may come up with in terms of how a third party appeals may work in Western Australia. I know comments from the gallery that maybe we have some policy concerns that are the reasons why we may not win such appeals, but I actually think that's I consider that quite separate to the idea as to whether or not there should be third party ideals and if we did if we if they were in place and people did keep appealing and we kept on being told that our town planning scheme was, was bad or our policies were bad then just as it is at DAPS on occasion and SAT, it's a, it's the onus is on us to improve our policies and our scheme rather than to um, use that as a reason not to really see if we can flesh out for, through WALGA this um, concept of third party. I mean, I can see that there are reasons why we don't have third party appeals and that you know governments may not be keen to have it and that people may not see better outcomes even if we did have them, but I'm interested to see um, how it progresses. Thank you. Um, thank you. I will also address a couple of comments from the gallery um, yeah, uh, that were made. Uh, I think we were accused of having, or I think we or the staff or somebody, the city broadly was accused of having a fundamental misunderstanding of the policy framework and how it works. Well, that's just garbage. Um, so it, it's quite clear we were given quite explicit instruction uh, in relation to the development of our policy uh, by the department in conjunction with the development of our scheme. Uh, and also uh, via feedback directly from the DAP to DAP members, to the mayor, current and former, to the CEO, and the three directors of, or acting director and two directors of planning that sat um, alongside the DAP over the time that policy was being developed. And we were told quite clearly that uh, the, and there is absolute truth that the performance, we have a performance based planning system, which means the deemed to comply is one way of meeting that performance <coughs> criteria. I, was in a SAT mediation yesterday where that was the very first thing that the member said and was quite clear on it to say that it is only, there, are, you know, there are no limits where you have a discretionary scheme or otherwise. But the clear instruction we were given is that you, the guidance as to how that discretion is utilised comes through policy. And I absolutely agree that saying there is a height limit in, poli in policy, uh, if it's presented incorrectly, can be misconstrued by community. But the principle of it is not to try and convince community of the validity of it, but to actually have something there that the decision-making bodies, whether they be councils or the DAP, will actually uh, give recognition to. And the, uh, I won't talk too much about the Wright Street example that's been uh, alluded to in the policy, um, in part because I was sitting on the panel for, for the decision, but uh, I don't think it's, and I don't necessarily think that it's that closely related to third, righty, third, right, third party appeal rights in principle, but it's absolutely a circumstance whereby the city be, uh, quite rightly believes that we would have, uh, would have and should potentially have grounds to contest the decision uh, and the idea that uh, SAT or another body would, would ignore it is simply unfair given that our policy framework has been developed specifically with that in mind. I think uh, largely through the DAP process in particular, but if councils were told that unless you have something in your scheme it's largely irrelevant, well, most of most schemes, as far as I understand, are pretty much the model scheme text with a few tweaks here and there. And I think that most uh, most of what goes on in planning and community expectation will be tossed out the window across the state. So I think that's a very dim view of what the actual planning environment is. Uh, and we have tried to work within the system. Again, I say it each time, but uh, I, I personally, um, at the time, uh, and I still believe there are some. Ch I didn't support the policy at the time. Believe there are some changes that need to be made. But where it, to the extent that the policy uh, has the in, ha, or our policy suite has the intent of couching uh, how discretion should be applied, we are miles in front of where we used to be, and yet we still seem to uh, the idea of third party appeal rights um, appeals to me if I can say that uh, in that it does give the ability to uh, to enter into a legi legitimate process whereby we can uh, we can espouse or stand up for the the rights of our community and for uh, for what we believe is, is, is fair and just in terms of our policy framework. No question, we sometimes get it wrong and there are sometimes gaps, but I think the fact that, uh, um, and particularly also this, the way that the system is set up such that an applicant, from an applicant's perspective, seeking to get an outcome 
it is cheaper, quicker and easier and more engaging for them to actually end up in the SAT than it is to go through a council or the, or the, or the, the DAP process because uh, we had a situation where we've currently got something before the SAT uh, that was the result of a deferral um, and the planning consultant quite happily will sit in SAT and say, well, the only way I can engage with the decision makers is to appeal it because they have no, no access to them. And so I think there are some fundamental flaws in the system whereby um, you know, there are good examples where consultative uh, processes from the beginning can actually deliver good outcomes. And whilst the idea of an appeal is obviously adversarial in nature, it provides a further opportunity for that uh, consultative process to perhaps deliver an outcome for everybody. So I support the officer recommendation and hopefully we get some traction on it before too long. Councillor Hallett. Just for the benefit of the uh, member of the public gallery that might be watching at home, that the uh, Wright Street um, development has been removed from the um, motion as it reads now. Any further comments? Okay, I'll just state that I also support the officer recommendation to provide third party appeal rights for local government and or a person who's living in an adjoining lot to um, the development application lot. Um, against the decision of ADAP. I think that our planning framework has changed significantly um, with the advent of development assessment panels and I think that um, this has really kind of shifted power away from local governments and um, what we're seeing is that the development assessment panel is making key decisions on major developments which have impact on streetscape, um, story heights, um, transition zones, whether we want them or not. And I think that um, we really have seen the advent of a... Um, I don't think that the due regard that local planning policy is intended to be given is really being given. And I think that third party appeal rights will not only give local governments and um, adjoining neighbours the right to appeal, but hopefully it will also um, put on notice uh, the DAP that their decisions do, um, will be required to be scrutinised not only by developers but by the local government, um, the relevant local government and the adjoining landowners. I think that the Wright Street development is a um, very good case study of where the City of Vincent probably would not have hesitated to appeal that decision given that it um, really took um, a position on um, on stories where we were basically saying three stories is the um, is the correct height here, and the DAP argued that it was actually a transitional um, a transitional area, which was not the intention, which was clearly um, established in our brand new built form policy, a policy which was. Um, brought about through the, through the council in consultation with the community and aligned with the community's values and vision. Um, I've had a long held view on development assessment panels in that I don't believe that they're necessary and that councils, if they are meeting their density targets and making good decisions, um, they, that we should be at very least be able to opt out of a development assessment panel process if the development assessment panel um, is to remain, if that's the view of the state government. And I believe that um, we are the democratically elected officials, that we develop our local planning policy. We are best placed to make the decisions around these significant developments in our neighbourhoods. So I'm also very pleased to reconfirm the City of Vincent's position on development assessment panels, but also recognising that um, we don't know whether the current state government will wish for them to continue, and in that circumstance, third party appeal rights um, are, are a step forward and a step in the right direction. So I um, wholeheartedly support this, and I'll be very interested to see where the Welga discussion goes from here. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I declare it carried. I just want to ask if anyone is here for the debate on number 211 Scarborough Beach Road, which is the petrol station. Um, I might just go to 9.4 because we do have a gentleman in the gallery that's here to um, hear about parking and had a question. So if we go to item 9.4 first, proposed amended parking restrictions, Mount Hawthorne Town Centre. Do I have a move for this item? Councillor Toppleberg, seconded Councillor Buckles.
Thank you. Uh, question through you to the Director of Community Engagement, just if we can get, uh, or Development Services, can we just get a response in relation to the question about parking permits uh, at 73 Flinders Street, which is a little bit up the road? Uh, yes, through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, under council policy, the address, um, whether it be subject to subdivision, um, is applicable, uh, can have parking permits applied um, once parking restrictions are approved within, within that street. So uh, effectively, the answer is yes. So, and just to confirm, this current system is that any dwelling is entitled to uh, three, up to three permits and they're not designated visitor, visitor, resident or otherwise, is that correct? Correct. Through you, Mayor Cole, the permits now run with the property um, and it will be up to three permits for a single detached house. Thank you, Director. Are there any further comments or questions in relation to this item? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Thank you. We'll go back now to item 9.3, which is 211 Scarborough Beach Road, Mount Hawthorne, proposed demolition of existing buildings and construction of a service station. Do I have a mover for this item? Councillor Buckles and seconded Councillor Hallett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Look, I'll keep a quick look. I think that the quick, even not quick, I think that the um, officer recommendation is sound. I think we're on good grounds for refusal of this development. It's, um, it's not a permitted use, it's an AA use which requires advertising and the like, and it's well within our rights under the scheme to um, deem this not appropriate for this particular location. Um, and that's it, really. I'm very happy to support the officer recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Buckles, and seconded by Councillor Hallett. Thank you. Um, yes, I agree with the officer's recommendation, and I guess also a note in response to the question at last week's briefing that the applicant doesn't appear to have been in contact with the city prior to submitting the application, and given the ex extent of that non-compliance um, that comes about with the recommendation for refusal, significant time might have been saved for both the applicant and the administration had some of that communication happened earlier. Any further comments? Okay, look, I will comment on this one. I tend to agree, Councillor Hallett, that I believe that um, in the history of this site is that uh, we recently had a car wash application. Um, there was um, a significant community concern about the car wash, given the location and the um, movement of traffic through a car wash. And at the time that this application came in, I did ask the director whether the applicant was aware of that particular situation and was advised that they were. This application has dragged on for a long time. I know there's been a lot of toing and froing between the applicant and the city. And I also understand that the applicant's been fully um, briefed on all of the um, non-compliances, of which there are many, the fundamental being the EPA buffer of 50 metres, given the proximity to residential addresses, to the childcare centre with an outdoor um, play area which effectively faces this site and the primary school which is um, just sort of diagonally opposite. Um, there are so many reasons for refusal and I do feel that this has been um, a long time in processing this application that it's caused significant concern in the community. Um, the community has asked why is the City of Vincent pursuing this application and my advice back to them is because we are obliged. It's a statutory process and if an applicant chooses to proceed with an application then they have every right to do so despite the fact that we have given clear and consistent advice to the applicant about the many, many non-conforming aspects of this application. So. Um, um, I am a little disappointed that it's taken up this much of the city's time. It has caused quite considerable um, concern in the community, but I wholeheartedly endorse the officer's recommendation to refuse, and I believe that the grounds are very strong, and, um, and there are many of them. And I'd also just like to note that since the briefing, um, based on some feedback from a, a resident with ex expertise in, um, in uh, air quality, that the conditions have also been increased to talk about 
um, potential impact of gas, odour and noise emissions. So they've been um, strengthened since the, the um, motion was discussed at the briefing last week. So um, I have no hesitation in supporting the officer met recommendation and I hope that we can move on from further discussions of petrol stations and car washes at this location. Um, the CEO just wishes to speak and then I'll come back to you, Councillor Buckles. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, just a question to the Director in relation to reason number 11. Um, just as a point of clarification, the reference in the reference states are having regarding to, obviously that's just intended to say, having regard to clause 67N of, I think the words schedule 2, perhaps need to be included there relating to the planning and development regulations, which are the deemed provisions of those regs, given that there's actually no uh, clause 67N of the regulations themselves. But my recollection is that that's Schedule 2. So um, it might just um, reinforce the application of that reason for refusal if the words Schedule 2 are included um, after the words clause 67 bracket N of, if that's the case. Can I have a mover for that amendment, please? Moved Councillor Buckles, seconded Councillor Toppleberg. Um, I assume no one wishes to discuss that. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Councillor Buckles? Just my question was, just um, in relation to this being a, an AA use in the scheme, would it be a complicated thing if we were to actually, as a council, consider making service station an ex-use in a number of our town centres, just to make it crystal clear where we don't want to have service stations, rather than leave in this slightly grey area? Uh, through, the mayor, that, through the Mayor, that's certainly an option for Council, absolutely. I don't think it would be too complicated. Um, it would depend on the zoning, but that's something that um, administration can analyse and um, put an amendment together. What's complicating it right now is the current scheme, um, but nevertheless we'll, we'll review the scheme and provide you with some further information about the situation and what the options are. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare it carried. That completes development services for the evening, so we'll now move on to technical services. Do I have a mover for item 10.1, Hyde Street Reserve proposed extension? Move Councillor Toppleberg, seconded Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, so, great idea, great use of uh, internal resources. Uh, it's not that complex in terms of, uh, so I'm very glad to see that for not much more than what it's supposedly going to cost us to do some of the design work in other parks. We're actually going to be able to deliver a result on the ground. Um, that's fantastic. I will ask a question, though. There is a reference to consultation. Uh, given, uh, and obviously letters to surrounding areas could extend probably given well, as, as far south as Vincent Street and as far north as Walcott Street, I would imagine, given there's not much open space in the area. Um, is it the intent for us to have somebody either... Um, I don't know, maybe somebody on site for a period of time, or is it intended to actually go on site and consult with people within the reserve, or is it just something that we're looking at doing a letter drop uh, in, the, in the area? Because I do think the usage of it is, is quite broad, and I don't want to spend thousands and thousands on letters going in a, in a ridiculous radius, but at the same time, I think it would be useful to... Yes, I'll ask it as a question. Is there intent to have somebody on site and speaking to people in the reserve? Uh, through the chair... Typically, we would do a letter drop, but um, the idea of actually having an on-site consultation has got merit, obviously. We've already spoken to the adjoining property owners, and they're well aware of it. So it's something that I can discuss with the parks manager about organising it. If, if, I, mean, I don't need to include it in there, but I just think that would be helpful, given that it's quite... It, because of the nature of it, it is tiny, but I think that, the, obviously, the immediate, immediate properties in a reasonable radius uh, would get letters, but I think that the usage it does come from quite a broad area, so if we could do that at strategic time, the after-schools weekends, we might get some interesting feedback. 
Councillor Gontoszewski. Uh, look, I'm supportive of this. I note that obviously increasing access to open space and also additional turf, which has been raised by um, adjoining residents and users of the park. Um, I think the proposed design um, will both retain a fully fenced park area, um, but also allow access to the right of way. Suggest that um, maybe a, an on-site on -site sign with the map, with the proposed design would also be beneficial if that wasn't already planned on being included. Any further comments? No. Uh, look, I just did ask a question at the briefing about the consultation and the response in the briefing notes talked about um, Forest Elm and Elmer to the extent of William and Norfolk would receive letters. I thought that at the very least it would be important to cover that section of Norfolk that mirrors the section of Hyde Street that will be closed off if that's not already going to be included and also the section of Hyde which continues down to Raglan because I think that will impact on the way in which the travel tra traffic flows through there. Um, so if that could also be accommodated as a minimum. Um, and also I just wanted to comment that I'm really pleased with the design as you know we um, Sometimes we go externally to look at designs where we're looking at developing an open space over a period of time. But in this particular case, it is a, a small pocket local park and the design that's come up being um, brought to us by tech services really delivers a really good outcome. It effectively doubles the open space by reclaiming that section of road which has quite low traffic numbers on it and is, um, as we understand, supported by the two immediate adjoining neighbours. So I think that this could be a really great enhancement to the, the Hyde Street Reserve and um, doubling a small park I think will, would, could be of great benefit to the local community. So I understand that this is going out for consultation and that we will see what the community has to say about this but I'm quite excited by the proposal and um, be looking forward to hearing what the community thinks about it. Councillor Toppleberg. Just a question through you um, to Mr Wilson. Can I just, yeah, exactly. I, even though I, I admire the enthusiasm, is there a typo there that it's a Rose to Parks demonstration project, not a demolition project? <laughs> so in so doing, I'll seek to amend recommendation one that it be a Rose to Parks demonstration project, but we look forward to the demolition. We quickly need a seconder for that, <laughs> Councillor Lowden. All those in favour, declare it carried. <laughs> Um, nice save, Councillor Toffelberg. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour, I declare it carried. <laughs> Moving on to item 10.2, proposed road safety and traffic management improvements in Redfern Street, North Perth and Randall Street, Perth. Councillor Toffelberg moving, seconded. Councillor Lowden. I move to delete recommendation one. Please. Do I have a seconder, Councillor? I'll take it from the seconder of the motion, Councillor Lowden. Would you like to speak to it? Given the time and effort that's already been put into this, that's the point of getting rid of it, so no, thank you. Councillor Toppelberg. Oh, sorry, Councillor Lowden. I concur. Is that uh, anyone else wish to elaborate? Councillor Gondoszewski. Uh, I think that this is, uh, I'm supportive of the amendment. I think that um, it is an expensive intervention that is not supported by the data and also may be impacted by other improvements. Uh, so I, yes, supportive of this. Thank you, Councillor Gondoszewski. Is there any further comments? I did just want to ask a question because I couldn't tell from the plan with the um, raised plateau. Is it actually brick paved or is it red asphalt? Uh, through the chair it's red asphalt. I thought that it might be paved at $30,000 but obviously <laughs> red asphalt is still quite costly. Um, look, I had asked whether there might be consideration of a cheaper treatment in this location but I take the point of... Councillor Gondoszewski, that given that the works are going to occur on the um, intersection with Walcott Street, um, that this could have a, an impact on the traffic flow through Redfern Street. So I think that proceeding with that part of the traffic calming is sensible and then we can 
reassess if we need to. I know that the residents will be disappointed and that this is something that they have lobbied for for some time, so I just do want to um, put that on the record that I understand that this is something that the residents are very passionate about and care deeply about. So um, personally I would be happy to look at that intersection again once we've dealt with the intersection with Walcott, um, but otherwise I, su I support the amendment. So I'll put the amendment... Oh, Yes, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? Thank you. Back to the substantive. Are there any further comments? Yes. Councillor Toppelberg? Yes, yeah, so just um, the uh, in relation to that, I did have a con brief conversation with Mr Wilson at the conclusion of the briefing, and there are, um, within existing budgets, there are opportunities to do things such as increasing the height of the first or the steepness of the first hump on Redfern Street as you come up from Charles Street, which would discourage speeding and certainly discourage large truck movements. So that is certainly a far cheaper option to go and put a, a short skin of uh, bitumen uh, at, the, at the front edge just to, just to increase that first hump, which would be uh, act as a strong deterrent either to speeding or to large vehicles using it. So I think there are other opportunities there. But beyond that, um, the other two matters uh, I support two, and I'll be interested to see what comes back with three, because uh, it would be uh, good to see potent some, some other potential treatments um, on Randall Street, but we'll see what comes back from consultation. Thank you. I just want to ask a question on that to the Director um, of Technical Services. Uh, if it was something as simple as increasing the profile of one of the speed humps, is that something that could be covered by the miscellaneous traffic budget? Uh, through the Chair, yes, that certainly could be. Councillor Hallett. Sorry, Councillor Loden first and then Councillor Hallett. Sorry about that. Um, I'm happy to support the revised amendment as it sits at the moment, but for item three I'm not convinced that um, the low profile speed bumps will achieve the desired outcome, which is deterring people from shooting down that street. I think that will still happen. Um, so I guess I have a concern that once this comes back from consultation, if that that will ultimately achieve what, what the residents are looking for and it would be great to get a better understanding of if that's, that's likely because with the low profile seat bump I still think people will, will rat run down that street. I guess following on a little bit from that but I did just want to um, concur with the Mayor's comments just about that these were things that the residents came to the city about and thank them for I guess the effort and consideration that they put in in terms of thinking through what um, they wanted and also engaging with their neighbours about what might be uh, amenable um, for the whole street. Um, I guess I am a little bit concerned just about the, the RSAG process of how quickly it, it came to that meeting and in terms of the, the level at which we really got to engage with the experts around the table to discuss it them in a lot of detail um, and so I guess I'm interested in seeing if we can revisit at some point how I guess we can maximise their expertise but also look at how we can engage a range of traffic calming options in the consultation period um, to check in with residents and also around what data is being used to, to guide it um, and then in particular looking at how we can ensure that any traffic calming um, initiatives also are reviewed for their um, impact on cyclists. Um, perhaps I could answer that. Um, I'll just explain if anyone's web streaming at home. RSAG is the Road Safety Advisory Group, which is an internal um, advisory group made up of myself and Councillor Hallett, our city's tech services team and community representatives. I think that a sensible way to approach that, Councillor Hallett, because you raise a very valid point, would be that perhaps we seek a meeting with the Director of Tech Services and sit down and talk about the pro procedure for items coming through to the Road Safety Advisory Group meeting. So, um, Director, unless you have anything further to add, I'll, I'll arrange a meeting where we can sit down and talk about the way in which pro traffic um, calming proposals come to the Road Safety Advisory Group meeting. Director, do you wish to comment? Uh, through the Chair, no, thank you. I think that makes sense to actually set some minimum criteria rather than just assume that there is an issue. Further comments? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Moving on to item 10.3, Beatty Park Leisure Centre Remedial Works. This one is an absolute majority decision. Do I have a mover for this item? Councillor Toppelberg, Councillor Gondoshevsky.
All right, moved Councillor Tobelberg, seconded Councillor Gonczewski. You don't, oh, sorry, you're saying you don't wish to speak. I thought you were not happy with the way no, no, you no, tried no, to describe not, not the moving no. and seconding. I, I was, unfortunately, <laughs> considering that perhaps uh, Betty Park Remit Leisure Centre Remedial Work should become its own item list uh, in the yes, future. Yes, standing but, item. Um, yes, I, I agree. I, I wasn't going to comment, but since you invited it twice, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> Councillor Gonczewski, does anyone wish to comment? Councillor Loden? Um, I guess just one comment is that this is a clear safety issue and it needs to be addressed immediately, so um, support that this, uh, that this action is taken. Um, I will just comment that the um, replacement of the pool deck poles um, was necessary and that the poles that had suffered corrosion were confirmed as removed on the 13th of June 2017 and that we are still seeking... Um, doing the design and scope works, etc., for the to deal with the issue of the plant rooms. Um, look, this is not a good news story. Um, it's not something that um, that is a good read. It's very concerning, um, and I think that it is part of um, our history in that renovation has happened to the front end of Beatty Park. We've delivered fast, fantastic gym, etc., and that the, um, that the historic section of Beatty Park has not received the attention that it, that it needed. Um, what does give me comfort is that I believe that now a comprehensive and thorough approach is being taken by administration and council. Um, all of the components at Beatty Park are being as assessed for safety and that the, um, this includes not just structural integrity but also BCA compliance and full risk assessment are being undertaken and that I believe that overall this will result in a proper, coordinated, evidence-based and long-term um, asset management plan is, is going to also be put in place by early 2018. So while the history is not good, I do believe that this council and administration is on the right path to dealing with Beatty Park in a comprehensive and proper manner and that does, um, that does give me some sense of, um, I can't quite think of the word, um, comfort when I read this report which, which is an uncomfortable report. So unless there's any further comments I'll put the item. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Moving on now to um, corporate services. Item 11.4, Delegated Authority Review 2017. This one has been raised because it requires absolute majority decision. Can I have a mover? Councillor Gonsashevsky, seconded Councillor Loden. Do you wish to speak? No, I'm happy to support the recommendation. Councillor Loden, any further comment? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Now to community engagement. We have item 12.1, which is number 34, Sheraton Street, Perth, progress report number eight. Do I have a mover for this item? Moved Councillor Gonsashevsky, seconded Councillor Buckles. And thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm, I'm, in some ways, I'm sort of sad when I'm speaking about this because um, I think that... Um, uh, but I, I'm, I may be saddened because I support the recommendation, um, but I, and I do sort of feel in some ways I, I can understand why we may see some uh, of our residents within the Norwood Precinct um, that are, are feeling that they've gone down a long road since January 2010 uh, with great hopes of a local community centre at the Cheriton Street property. Um, and uh, in whenever we have spoken to them, it's clear from contact that we've had with residents that, um, that they see a great deal of potential for this site and that um, we know that this group is... Um, we, we know that we have some really dedicated and community-minded altruistic people that are involved with the Norwood Neighbourhood Association um, and that they see this as being um, a, a key component of uh, them being able to build community in their local area. I accept that the Norwood Precinct um, is somewhat cut off from other areas within Vincent. Lord Street's a really busy street. We've got the train line. Um, however, um, I can't in all good conscience um, continue to what I is putting off the inevitable. Um, I think we have a uh, perhaps a different understanding of Vincent's financial position. Um, 
and or our financial obligations in our asset maintenance going forward. Uh, we have a different approach perhaps in community engagement, looking to partner and, um, and engage within the community rather than potentially um, be the um, key drivers of um, uh, the you know, service delivery in that regard. And we've also seen the advent of things like co-working spaces within the commercial realm. So I can't really think of any other course of action that... Um, I can't think of a circumstance at this point in time where I could support Vincent retaining an asset, refurbishing it, maintaining it, potentially operating it, or looking to attract a key commercial tenant into a residential area um, for the purpose of running a community centre um, where we have the community needs analysis that has identified um, primarily issues around pedestrianisation, safety and improvements to the public realm around the local parks as being of the, re uh, the key priority. Um, I note that the recommendation looks to excise off um, the community garden and I hope that we can work with the Norwood Neighbourhood Association um, and the state in order to um, hopefully see that um, come to fruition. Um, but I think that um, we're just, I just don't feel that we're in a position to um, continue this on and I feel that, in, that we possibly have had some opportunities to, um, I guess, rip the Band-Aid off in some ways earlier on, but because we have, um, I guess we've also sort of bought into that dream, um, I think we've, we've allowed the process to run its course. I think it's really important to note that our com community engagement directorate um, is, is really proactive and certainly is looking to engage with the NNA around ensuring that they have access to community meeting spaces um, and to potentially deliver services for their community to meet um, and to grow their membership base. Um, but I think at this point in time I'm supportive of the officer recommendation um, and um, which will lead to um, us um, ceasing our management order and looking to just continue with the community garden um, for the NNA. Thank you Councillor Gondraszewski, that was very well um, described. Are there any other councillors that wish to speak? Councillor Buckles. I'll spoil it by being far less eloquent than Councillor Godchefs, you was. But I, I remember when we, um, when we took on this from the Department of Lands and we actually, we actually fought quite hard to be given the opportunity to manage this, this building at the request of the, of the community, which, if, if I'm not mistaken, even predates the existence of the Norwood Neighbourhood Association. We saw there was value in this. However, they were at, at different times where we did have a different approach to, to finances at, at Vincent's. And I think the reality is that the, the financial realities of bringing this building back to, back to a functional status uh, is really beyond the financial, well, not necessarily beyond our financial capacity, but uh, the financial priorities of, of the city at, at this stage. Um, I note that we did receive an email from a member of the Norwood Neighbourhood Association quite late in the day today with a, with a last sort of impassioned plea to not make this decision tonight. And it, it did, I just wanted to note that it referenced, um, you know, considering using a third party to look after it along the Sprouts. Um, and we did, we did consider the, the Sprouts organisation as what, what they sort of delivered. However, I must admit my recollection at the time, and I, I don't know who was here even when we were doing, doing the Sprouts investigation, was that 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 was a precursor to not continuing down this building and having some other sort of way of doing it. So I think that, you know, as a group, I'm still keen on there being some alternate method of servicing the needs of the, of the Norwood Neighbourhood Association, and not just the association, but it is a slightly isolated annexed um, area of incident, so I can understand that they want more. But I think we will be able to give them more, not having this burden of the, of the financial reality of um, restoring, restoring this building. And certainly I just want to state um, that I'd, I'd be surprised if the City of Vincent wasn't still committed to delivering quality, quality services in, the, in this precinct. Any further comment? Councillor Hallett? Just a question, um, just in relation to some commentary um, around Lord Street and the kind of barrier that that provides. Are there any plans around pedestrian um, 
safety measures or crossings um, that have been on the table, I guess, to the Director of uh, Technical Services? Uh, through the Chair, the last time there was any pedestrian improvements was during the redevelopment of Nibs Stadium. As far as I'm aware, there's no future plans, and that also goes for the impact of the new Perth Stadium, which will obviously attract pedestrians, but it doesn't extend as far as Lord Street. Anything further, Councillor Hallett? Um, look, I'll just make a few comments on this. I do. Um, I think that Councillor Gondoszewski really covered it well in terms of talking about the dream of Sheraton Street, and I think the city has a large responsibility because I do think that this has been something that has gone on over a number of years. In that, um, you know, we negotiated. Well, when I say we. Council of the time, negotiated to have the House come into the city's control, went through um, many, you know, many steps to seek tenders, to get a Lottery West grant. At one stage we had um, about $380,000 of our own money on budget for this, as well as the Lottery West grant of $271,000. Um, there was you know, significant steps along the way where the city was committed to this project and I can understand in the context of that long history that this connection to Sheraton Street has formed between the NNA and, and, the, and the house and also the fact that the community garden has been going on in the backyard of, of, the, of the house for some time. Um, you know, I know that the motion talks about excising that part of the property and that is something that we still hope to do so that that community garden can remain where it is. But I do just want to acknowledge that it has been a long journey and I can understand why those ties have formed around Sheraton Street and why this is a difficult decision um, for NNA as well as for council and, and administration. It's, um, but when you look at it from the business point of view of running the, um, sort of first of all, refurbishing the house and then running it, it's extremely difficult to justify. And I think that the shift that has happened in the meantime when, when um, we work through this process is, first of all, the funding had to be delayed because that was the time of the um, 2014 significant budget issue that we found ourselves in and expenditure of this, this amount was um, substantial and unaffordable at the time. And then from that whole process where out we um, had that significant issue with our finances that we have effectively had such change within our administration. Um, that was the first thing that our CEO pretty much dealt with and upon his appointment in 2014 and I was impressed that he didn't run screaming out of the building never to be seen again. So kudos to you CEO for sticking around and seeing the process through. But I think that that really was a transitional point in the, in the history of the City of Vincent and it's led to um, doing things like a community needs analysis which has only just been done but really should have been done back in 2010 at the beginning of the process and it's led the City of Vincent to do a new approach to our halls and buildings to actually look at all of the assets that we own because we do own a lot of little houses and a lot of halls and a lot of facilities across the City of Vincent that are underutilised so this whole body of work has, has also been managed well under our new Director for Community engagement, Mick Quirk, who's taken on the task of doing this body of work that really wasn't even considered at the time back in 2010. Um, and also in terms of um, our community use and occupancy of our existing buildings and our asset maintenance to ensure that they're actually not only at a good standard but actually maintained. We've just been talking about Beatty Park. So the city has come a long way and I think that while the idea of the Sheraton Street House really captured the imagination for NNA and for the city at the time, that that transition's happened and I think that we we still have a big heart at Vincent, but we use our heads more when we make these decisions, and I think that we really do things in a much more considered way. Um, so I do feel for the NNA, but I know that the city will continue to work with this, with this neighbourhood organisation of, of passionate people to make sure that they do thrive and that they do have a place to go and to meet. Um, Sprout was one of the concepts that former staff member Ryan Hall did talk to um, Norwood Neighbourhood about and they went down to Alcamos and saw the shipping containers down there which um, I was fortunate enough to see recently with the CEO and Councillor Jimmy Murphy when we 
went down that way to look at the Catalina Estate through our roles on the, the Tamala Park Regional Council. Um, and that sort of thing still remi remains an option to explore. Um, the other issue that's um, being looked at is um, the um, community engagement team has been dealing with Claysbrook Design Community regarding potential ongoing usage of a meeting room at, at that facility. So there's a number of um, pathways forward and um, this is not the end of um, encouraging NNA to grow and prosper but it's just, it's just I guess the end of the Sheraton Street idea which now that we've done this body of work had the community needs analysis, et cetera, we have, we have had to make this decision, which I believe we're heading towards in imminently, to say that this is not really something that we can continue to, to go down the path when we actually have a good hard look at what it means in terms of cost to the city um, and when there are other opportunities out there. Um, there were also issues raised in the email that I did read before the meeting from a member of the NNA about other issues like toilet facilities, etc. And those are things that we can continue to work through and explore because I think there were some very valid points about some of those other facility issues in that email. So that conversation can continue and as we, as we look at how we can improve um, the area for the neighbourhood. So um, that's about it from me. Um, are there any further comments in relation to this? Okay. I'll put it. All those in favour of the officer recommendation and declare it carried unanimously. Okay, so we're moving on now to 12.3, Public Open Space Strategy. To have a mover, Councillor Gondoshevsky, seconder, Councillor Loden. I won't take up too much time. I just want to say that I'm pleased that we're progressing, that the initial desktop review has been undertaken. I'm supportive of the project plan to develop a local public open space strategy. Uh, Mayor Cole previous, it spoke in the previous item regarding um, the fact that we do things in a more considered way here at Vincent and uh, I'm pleased to say that since I've been on council I've observed um, a, a real intent across the organisation and in council to um, operate in that considered manner where we have a strategic focus where we're responsive to needs rather than potentially being reactive. Um, I think that this recognises a strategic approach is required to ensure ongoing access to open space and an accepted level of service. I think it's in particularly important to assist Vincent in managing increased density without compromising on the health, social, environmental and economic benefits that open space brings to our community. And I think um, it's important to note that this strategy um, will need to be accompanied by, and it's incorporated in the um, information around the project plan and open space implementation plan. I think this will be crucial uh, so we have a mechanism to deliver against specific strategies to improve existing parks, maintain access to open space and this may include land repurposing such as the Hyde Street Park uh, as previously discussed and also strategic land acquisition. Thanks. Uh, I guess to echo Councillor Gonsashevsky's comments, I think this is great that we've got this plan that's to go forward. Um, I guess my only comment on addition to that is as we move forward with this, um, one of the things I feel that's going to be really critical with this is how we set our target for public open space. Um, the report speaks to the fact that it's 10%, which is based on a figure of um, sites that I believe are either R10 or R15 from memory. We're clearly much higher density than that and we probably most likely need to come up with a, a figure for head of population for what we have as a population now, but then also what we have as a population in the future. I guess one interesting reflection is that the need for public open space probably actually increases per person as you increase density because these people don't have access to a backyard and lots of space within their existing property so they are confined to um, a much smaller personal space and therefore need to have more open space. I 
as, as a person who has previously lived in a small unit, I spent very little time in that unit and being able to get out to public open spaces is critical to my, my own well-being um, and it's clearly an issue that we need to address within the city. So um, I guess I look forward to discussing further how we go about setting those targets um, and also that would then feed into any potential contribution model as well. Thank you. Questions for you to Mr Quirk. I asked, asked the CEO, I've asked it a few times at um, uh, our workshops, but I'll ask it again because I haven't asked it yet in the council meeting. Are you comfortable that $50,000 is sufficient in order to deliver the strategy and the level of detail that you know that uh, both the administration and certainly the council usually expects and demands, and particularly uh, I can see there being ongoing work uh, arising from this, but are you comfortable that $50,000 is sufficient allocation? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, based on the, the project plan and the split of responsibilities between administration and a consultant, uh, yes, we are comfortable that that budget is sufficient. We have indeed have uh, a couple of consultants. Just cost the um, the consultancy elements of the project plan, which gives us greater comfort that the uh, that the budget is sufficient based on the the current scope. Just further to that, given this is obviously the development of a strategy, uh, is it? The vision that that's the the outcomes of that strategy obviously will require budget allocation going forward. Uh, a lot of which will probably fall in, under the tech services area, but that that will be dealt with on a year by year basis. Or is it envisaged that that's something that will still that will be a, a, a separate reporting area or, a, or a, uh, a, a as a strategy? Because I mean, as Councillor Gondoshevsky identified, there's um, whether we're talking about land acquisition, repurposing, other, there, there are a number of different areas across. The, the city's directorates where the, the implementation of the strategy may impact. Um, to my knowledge, that's not currently depicted other than having the strategy isn't currently in the corporate business plan um, going, going forward, uh, the implementation and the costs associated with it. So whether that's a comment from you or the CEO, I'd be interested to know because I, I can see there being a lot of great stuff proposed here, a lot of which will either be unaffordable or will certainly need to be planned for uh, strategically over many, many years. Um. Through you, Mayor Cole, it is an entirely valid point. The reason it's not yet reflected in the corporate business plan other than preparation of the strategy itself is that once Council adopts the strategy as part of the integrated planning and reporting framework, that will become one of the informing strategies that then is fed into the corporate business plan on a four-yearly rolling cycle. So. Any further comments? Oh, look, I'd just like to comment on that issue, Councillor Topperberg. I think it's a very valid question, but I'm personally very pleased to see the split between staff doing the work with the assistance of consultants rather than a reliance upon consultants. So I think that that's um, an approach that I'd like to see more of at the city. So hopefully that goes well. I think that's a very good um, way to do it, um, Director of Community Engagement. Um, also just like to say that this is um, a good body of work that is the precursor to our open space strategy and um, I'm very pleased to see that was ha that occurred in the time frame that we requested and that also gives confidence that um, the strategy is in good hands. So I really look forward to seeing the development of the strategy and, and talking about the issues identified by Council Loden about the you know, criteria and the way in which we assess the need for open space given that we do have a high density style um, inner city community um, emerging in Vincent. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I declare it carried. So that completes the... the Yes, is that is that a, that's not a report though? That's a notice of motion. Yeah, sorry, I was going to say that completes the report. So we're moving to the notice of motion. <laughs> Item fourteen point one. Do I have a mover? Councillor Hallett, seconder. Councillor Loden, I think was first. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this motion essentially requests that the City of Vincent uh, pr includes gender pay equity measures in our annual report, that the WA Local Government Association encourages other local governments to do likewise, and that the State Minister considers making this mandatory as part of their review of the relevant regulations. This motion connects to broader issues of gender inequality, representation, and in particular economic disadvantage for women in the later years of life. 
and at its core it seeks to ensure that local governments have the same requirement of accountability that private companies do. Without quality data, actions can't be taken to address any inequities that do exist, and I'm hopeful that this can assist our sector moving forward on this matter. I'd also like to thank the CEO for his support um, and hopefully see the same type of leadership um, in other local governments in WA. No further comment, Councillor Lowden. Does anyone else wish to speak? Um, all right, I'd just like to say thank you, Councillor Hallett, for bringing this forward and thank you to the CEO for being so responsive and um, uh, letting us know that that information will not only be included in our annual report but will be regularly updated to, um, to the Council. So thank you to both of you and I hope that Welga looks upon this favourably as a, another reform measure within the sector. All those in favour of the motion, I declare it carried unanimously. Okay, at this point we're going to move to the confidential part of the meeting, but before we do that, I'd just like to explain to anyone live streaming from home that what we will do is um, we have two confidential items on the agenda tonight, which is quite unusual these days at the City of Vincent. I'm not quite sure how long um, debate will take, but at the end of the confidential um, items, when we have taken the vote on those two items, we will actually come back to the Council meeting, and at that point I will read out the decisions of Council before closing the meeting. So there will be a blank screen, I'm not sure for how long, but at the end of, the, uh, of a period of time I'll be back to tell you the outcome of the decision of those two items. I don't think we've got any hold music or dance in Councillor Tuffelberg. <laughs> so, um, so we'll move to um, to go to behind doors. Can I have a mover for that? Councillor Gontoshevsky, seconded Councillor Hallett. All those in favour, declare it carried. Thank you. We've concluded the confidential part of our meeting tonight and so we've moved out of the confidential session. So for the um, two items that were just determined, um, I will read out the decisions of Council. The first item, 18.1, Confidential Report, Chief Executive Officer's Performance Review 2015. Um, the decision um, of Council, as moved by Councillor sorry, Councillor Toppelberg, seconded by Councillor Gondoshevsky, and with unanimous support, was as follows. It is a bit long, so bear with me. The Council one, receives the Chief Executive Officer's Annual Performance Review 2015-16 Summary Report included as Confidential Attachment 1 and endorses the outcome of the review that the Chief Executive Officer has met the performance expectations of the position for the 2015-16 review period. Two, appoints Ms Natalie Lincoln of Price Consulting Group, Proprietary Limited, to conduct the Chief Executive Officer's Performance Review for the period August 2016 to August 2017, as outlined in its confidential response to the City's request for quotation, and requires the review process to be concluded with a report to Council by no later than the 17th of October 2017. Three, establishes a CEO performance review panel comprised of Mayor Emma Cole, Councillor Gontoshevsky, Councillor Toppelberg and Councillor Loden to manage and have oversight of the CEO's annual performance review for the period August 2016 to August 2017 in liaison with the Council's appointed consultant in two above. And four, requests the Mayor and the Chief Executive Officer to develop a draft CEO performance and remuneration review policy for Council's consideration by 17th of October 2017, setting out, amongst other things, A, roles, responsibilities and timeframes for initiating, conducting and concluding the CEO's annual review process, B, the term of the membership for council members on the appointed CEO performance review panel. C, the term of appointment for the consultant to assist council in conducting the CEO's annual performance review. And C, the minimum mandatory methodology for reviewing the CEO's performance and remuneration. That is adopted as read out. In relation to confidential item 18.2, which was moved by Councillor Loden and seconded by Council, Councillor Tobelberg and unanimously supported, the outcome of that motion was a procedural motion that Council defers consideration of this matter pending the following. 
One, receipt of a report from the Mindari Regional Council that consolidates into a single document under relevant subjects and themes the various questions raised by the City of Vincent and all of the answers provided by the MRC and its consultants regarding the proposed waste to energy tender since 18th of May 2017. Two, provision of the report referred to in one above by the MRC to all member councils so that all members are provided with the same information regarding the proposed waste energy tender. And three, confirmation of the resolutions adopted by all other MRC member councils regarding the proposed waste energy tender. So that concludes the meeting for this evening and I declare the meeting closed at 17 minutes to nine. Thank you.